Occasionally, an event occurs of such significance that it forever changes the way you perceive life itself, as though a veil has been lifted and the clarity and purpose of your life become obvious. In November of 1993, such an event occurred for my family and I. I was one of the Native American children adopted at birth and removed from the reservation system. As fate would have it, I was raised by a wonderful family and grew up in southwest Minnesota. I lost both adoptive parents in 1987. It was then that my wife, Kathy, discovered my adoption papers that had been hidden for years. On Thanksgiving Day, 1993, I was reunited with my biological Lakota family. Neither of us had known the other had existed all those years. So began our incredible journey back into Native America. This is our story. On a family vacation in the Black Hills one summer, we happened upon Brule playing at the Buffalo Stockade in Deadwood, one of the popular Old West tourist towns. The music from this small upcoming band of three was as as captivating as the surrounding landscape. It was their distinct sound that initially caught my attention. The hauntingly beautiful mix of flute, keyboard, and traditional drum they are now famous for. Listening, one could immediately sense something deeper at the heart of it. Sure enough, in reading this man's artistic profile, I realized his life was equally captivating. As I read further, Paul's biography stated he was born in 1955 and raised in a small Midwest farming community in southwestern Minnesota. I felt an immediate connection to his age and background, and I wondered, how does one go from a typical high school kid who wanted to be a rock star, to a married husband and father of two with a 9-to-5 corporate job, to a man dressed in a fringed buckskin jacket with long black hair and distinctive American Indian features, standing at the keyboard smiling, playing such beautiful music with a look of contentment and joy on his face. Well, when we finally got to Deadwood, uh, we were still pretty green at the, at the art show circuit. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what our schedule would be. What we ended up doing was really performing uh, every day. We had an idea that we would just perform until it rained, uh, but it never really rained. The summer that we started out, and we went for, you know, over 30 days straight. But it taught us a lot. It wasn't long before we found out that there was really something unusual to what was happening. I mean the whole thing, the, the music and the audience and being able to go over a long period of time. Uh, I think it really, by the city of Deadwood taking this in under their wing and allowing us to be there that one summer, uh, it taught us a lot. It really launched a lot of things for us. And we, um, we came to appreciate and really love the city of Deadwood. In late June 1955, a woman arrived at St. Mary's Hospital in Pierre, South Dakota all alone and close to her time for delivery. She was in her mid-thirties and came from a good Indian family, highly respected in the community. The woman deeply loved her newborn son, but with her reasons still a secret, she made a most painful decision. With a heavy sadness in her heart, she wrote his name on the birth certificate, a name she chose with great care. Then she left the hospital leaving her infant son in the care of St. Mary's nurses. One day, when the baby boy was about five weeks old, a couple came to see him. The first time the husband and wife laid eyes on him, they were immediately taken with him. The nurses were reluctant to let him go because the baby boy had unequivocally captured their hearts. However, they knew the most important thing for the little boy was to have all the love and advantages a family could offer. With great joy, the husband and wife from the white world prepared to take the little boy from the Indian world into their home. The nurses could see the hand of God at work, intricately weaving the lives of these three souls together as a family. 
They knew, no matter the circumstances, God could bring together something beautiful and wonderful out of the weave. And so the nurses let him go. I grew up in a small white middle class farming community in southwest Minnesota. My brother and I grew up without the knowledge of our heritage. Well, you see, we were told that we were adopted. Uh, both of us knew that as young boys. But uh, the strange little twist in our story is that we were never really told that we were uh, Native American. And I think there was a reason for that. See, back in those days, it was still taboo to openly proclaim that you had Native American descent or lineage in your family tree. Well, I discovered at an early age that I had a love for music, and so it became my passion uh, quite young. Uh, I remember one day my dad came home, and I was probably about seven or eight, and he walked in the house and he had a box, and the box was what I thought was kind of a strange contraption. Anyway, it was an accordion, and he had bought it for me. We started rock bands probably when I was 13 or 14, and uh, you know, we had great times all the way up through high school. Uh, music was uh, a big part of my life. Shortly after high school, I married my high school sweetheart, Kathy, and we started a family. I worked a regular job during the day, but always had one part of me connected to music, often playing music gigs at night. We moved to the Minneapolis area, and for a while I played the piano at several nightclubs, and later ran a couple of clubs. I can tell you it's hard work to make a living and raise a family in the world of music. I took a job in the civil engineering field and settled into a 9 to 5 routine with a house in the suburbs. Then in 1987, I lost both parents within a matter of months. While sorting through their things, Kathy found an envelope that had been hidden away for years and in it were my adoption papers. Suddenly, right there in black and white was my birth name. I took time to grieve for my loss, but after a few years, Kathy could see I was dying on the inside and couldn't understand why. Thankfully, she knew what to do. She called my cousin, who worked at the hospital where I was born, St. Mary's Hospital in Pierce, South Dakota. Within a matter of days after visiting with Yvonne, one evening we received a phone call that forever changed my life. Kathy had found my biological family. She handed me the phone and a man's voice said, Hello bro, you are Lakota. Imagine how those words could forever change your life and everything you ever knew or believed about yourself. Stay with us and we'll be right back to share the full story. Sometimes it seems as though there's a master plan at work in each of our lives. The trick is to follow. On Thanksgiving Day in 1993, Paul was reunited with his biological family. Neither had known that the other had existed all those years. One evening I received a phone call, out of the blue you might say, and on the other end of the line was a gentleman who introduced himself as my biological brother. His first words to me were, hey bro, you are Lakota. Well, at the end of the conversation he said something that really forever changed the course of our lives. Uh, he said, come on home. Come on home. It was Thanksgiving 1993 when Paul and Kathy and their two children, Shane and Nicole, drove west. Well-meaning friends and family cautioned them about their trip. The journey was much more than a simple drive from Minnesota to South Dakota. It began a transition from one culture into a brand new world, from the familiar into the unknown. The community of Lower Brule was a mere 200 miles from where Paul had grown up and spent most of his life. It overwhelmed him to think that these people were going to meet him for the first time. His family were in one sense so close, yet seemingly an entire world away. Just the word, reservation, created a sense of something different, something separate. As the family neared Lower Brule, Paul himself wondered, how do you prepare yourself to face truths that have been hidden for decades? Right now he wasn't sure if this unearthing was positive or negative, a blessing or a curse. He tried to prepare himself to go either way, good or bad. I can remember as soon as we crossed the Missouri River at Chamberlain, the terrain changed from a rural farmland to a rugged rolling prairie. 
Shane, who was 16 at the time, said, Whoa, Dad, this looks like Dances with Wolves. And he was right, it did. Nicole, 14, was excited to meet her new cousins and urged me to drive a little faster. We met at the squeaky door. And I, so my brother and his wife and I are looking at Fritz the whole time, you know, on edge, wondering what was going on. And he said, I, have, I said, well, what, what did this lady have to say? And he said, I have a brother. And the phone rang. And I said, now if they call, don't give out any information until they yeah. give you any you information. So you went in the bedroom and answered, and I went in the other room. There was another phone mm -hmm. downstairs, and I listened, and it was Kathy. Mm -hmm. And that's Kathy when, yeah, and Kathy was, and asked for Fritz, and that was, he said, this is him. And um, that's when she started the conversation about Paul and, you know, where you lived and what you mm -hmm. did. And, and um, then that's when she led up to, do you want to talk to him? And then Fritz said, yes, mm -hmm. I do. Yes. And, and um, I think you guys talked for an hour. Yeah, of course, that was I, I listened to part of it. Yeah, I listened know. to part yeah. of it, and then I got yeah. off the phone. Yeah, no, that's when but that was the beginning Kathy of the handed you the phone said, here. Everybody, I just know. felt that it, it couldn't be a, a farce or anything. I mean, this had to come from somebody's heart. Mm -hmm. Why were they calling to start with? Um, and I just felt like it was true, you know? So we needed to get together. We needed to start learning about each other time to come home yeah I, I and I, I believed in my heart that right or wrong it would all fall into place right here we've got you can see the prairie dog town right here there's just there's a hundred acres just right here that, that just at the, at the part of the homestead everything else is west of us here and um, it, it's, it's all tribal ground it's all uh, Lord Blue Sioux tribe and I, I lease from them and run 100 to 140 head of cows, but um, from right here you can't really see it. It's just about a mile west of us, all, all the land. And right. the, the actual home site is, is our land, right? Mm -hmm. Right here. Now, how long have you guys acres. been out here? Like, when? Uh, we you? moved out here 82. December 20. December 24th, 1982. Paul is about to discover a most unexpected gift an inherited gift that altered the course of his life and brings him back to his one true passion, music. At age 38, Paul meets his biological family for the first time and discovers an inherited gift of music. Come along as we rejoin the LaRouche family on their amazing journey into Native America. On the family's first trip to the Lower Brule Sioux Reservation, Paul's brother Fritz, his wife Sherelle, and their family took them to Pier to meet his older sister, Susie. The two families sat down in the warmth of Susie's kitchen. Paul was eager to hear all that he could about his mother, father, grandparents, and great-grandparents. He could only imagine what life must have been like for them so long ago. The family said there was always music in the house and Grandma Ruth played by ear which was really neat to hear because that's exactly what Paul does. He plays by ear, he doesn't read music very well. They said that um, Grandma Ruth used to play a tune before every meal and they had to sit down at the table and they couldn't start eating until she finished the song. Fritz and Susie also shared with us about um, their great-grandmother, Mary Little Elk, who had a beautiful voice and uh, we were told that she loved to sing hymns in Lakota. As Paul processed all this new information, for the first time he realized music was in his blood. He inherited it. It was here in Susie's kitchen when Paul first heard the names of his ancestors. Grandpa Ben Thompson, described as the elite of the reservation, a rancher, hard worker, a man with a wonderful sense of humor. Grandpa Ben's parents, Joseph and Mary Thompson, who were married for 65 years, imagine 65 years, he decided their love must have been true and strong because they died within months of each other. Mary's grandfather was named Strikesthree, born in 1804 in the vast and unnamed territory of the Northern Plains. 
yet was a respected Yankton chief who received peace medals from three U.S. presidents in his lifetime. Known as a man of great character, he was the strongest and most faithful friend of the whites in the Sioux Nation and pursued peace between his own people and the settlers. Paul wondered, what would the voices of the past tell him if they could speak? It was late that cold November night by the time they left Susie's house and drove 60 miles back to Lower Brule on the dark, desolate road. To Paul, the setting echoed an eerie glimpse of days gone by, and he silently wondered how many times his mother, Arlene, had driven down the same road, imagining her own thoughts. What struggles did she face? What did she feel when she discovered she was pregnant? What made her keep the knowledge of her unborn child a secret from everyone, including her husband, sisters, parents? On a recent concert stop in Pierce, South Dakota, we um, couldn't believe it when some of the nuns from St. Mary's Hospital actually showed up to the show. Several of them remembered when Paul was born and um, it just touched my heart when they talked about Paul's mom Arlene and how painful it was for her to leave him behind. Her, her name was Arlene and she named Paul Arlen and it was actually Arlen Faye LaRush. She evidently wanted to make sure that uh, if Paul were to ever find his way home that he would make a connection between him and her. During the weeks Paul was in the nursery, the nuns grew to love baby boy LaRush as they held him day after day. They rocked him and cared for him and didn't want to see him leave their nursery. When the husband and the wife from the white world came to take the little boy from the Indian world into their home, the nuns could see the hand of God at work, intricately weaving the lives of these souls together. So it was that Paul became a son of two mothers, one gave him life, the one made him who he is today, a single strand of thread woven between two worlds, two cultures. It would be 38 years before the thread wove its way back to the reservation. Occasionally, an event occurs of such significance that it forever changes the way you perceive life itself. Now, the conclusion of our story. Paul's first journey back to the Lower Brule Sioux Reservation forever changed his own perception of who he was. He was no longer Paul Summers from Worthington, Minnesota. He was also Paula Rush, enrolled member of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. I have never been able to fully describe the feeling on that first trip to Lower Brule. There was a point where I stopped the car at the crest of a little hill. Down below was the tiny community where I would have grown up. During my first powwow the summer of 1994, I heard new sounds and rhythms. In that instant, the idea came to me, a blending of both worlds, both cultures, musically, the last musical frontier. From that point on, I read uh, in Indian Country Today magazine or newspaper uh, article about a Native American recording company you know, which is Sound of America Records down in Albuquerque and when he came back in January I believe uh, 1995 with his first CD We the People um, we listened to it and at that point we knew um, somehow we had to get the music out and to the world and at that point I realized after I heard um, Paul's brother saying when we first met them in 1993 that we needed to come home. In learning about his heritage, Paul discovered a mission from the heart to simply share his story in an effort to bring healing between two cultures. Well we began um, performing at small craft shows and malls wherever they would um, open the doors for us to set up and perform in. And it was really neat to see um, the reaction to people, because we were scared to death, not knowing what was going to happen. 
And, um, and over time, as we performed all over in bigger malls and starting to get into bigger events, we started getting phone calls, letters um, from people from all wa walks of life that um, were telling us how the music had affected them uh, for the better, um, spiritually, um, a lot of different things. And it's not something we set out to do. It's just the way our journey in life went. We couldn't have planned it. It's given me the opportunity to bring part of Native America into mainstream America. Through it all, I have always been proud of both worlds, not putting one above the other. We tell our story in the hopes of bringing healing. It has become my mission to help bridge the gap between the cultures and work on reconciliation. Imagine, the single strand of thread that found its way back to the reservation is now a beautiful tapestry displayed to audiences around the world in the form of a musical performance deeply moving, an experience in sight, sound, and soul to bring hope, peace, and reconciliation to the world. If I could talk to my great-grandfathers, I would say the old days are gone. But love, like the wind, is still here. When all else fades away, faith, hope, and love will remain. Those feelings that are so strong, so mysterious, will always be with us. I think of you, my relatives, and I thank you. Thank you for joining us for the first episode of our new television show for RFD-TV. We will continue to travel across the country and bring you the stories and share with you the, the interesting people and the places that we go. The Lakota, they have a saying, Mitako Yasi. It's a philosophy really and translated in English it means we are all related. I believe in the eyes of the Creator that we are in, intended to be equal children of one heart, one mind, and one body. From all of us from Brule, until next time, thank you and good evening.